All right, let's jump into our scripture, our time of study together. Um, we are um, going through uh, kind of an Advent season. We are uh, really looking at the idea of Advent. And if you've been following along with us uh, the last couple of weeks um, online, um, here's, here's where we've been. Um, first, let's just talk about Advent. Advent is this purposeful, getting ready, anticipation for the coming of Jesus. Now, what's cool is, like, there's two different aspects to that, right? There is one, this purposeful getting ready for the celebration of his first coming. So, like, what does it look like for us to actually get ready to celebrate Christmas as we know it and think about it? We talked about, like, the things that we kind of do to get ourselves ready. Some of us decorate, some of us sing specific songs only this time of year and there was a big debate this year like how soon could you start singing because like the year was awful so we're not waiting till after thanksgiving we're doing it in october because we can't wait for christmas right like some of you are that ridiculous um but like what are the ways and and things that you do to get our hearts and our lives truly ready to celebrate the the coming of christ but then there's the other aspect of like but what does it look like to truly get our hearts ready for his second coming. Like we know he came once, but he's coming again. And so what would it look like to get ourselves ready for his second coming? Is my life ready? Is my soul ready? And does my life reflect that I truly am ready? So what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, two weeks ago we looked at this idea of Advent being first our great need for the Advent of Christ. And we looked at Genesis 6, and we, we saw the great need that we have because love of God had been replaced or has been replaced by love of self, ultimately. That we reject, we, we turn away from God as our source of life and love and being, and we turn to us. And what this causes is actually grief in the heart of God and not anger and rage, but grief. To the point where he's like, oh, everything is ruined. And he makes this promise to Noah after the flood, then to Abraham, that he would fix this brokenness that exists in us. Then last week we looked at God's great promise. Uh, and we kind of honed in on Isaiah 59. We talked about our, this idea of hope, that we hope in a lot of things, but ultimately Real hope is only found in Jesus, and it truly only comes when we finally come to the place where we abandon all other hopes, where we finally abandon, like, I have placed hope in relationships, in identity, in all of these things, but, but they have all failed me, and real true hope only comes when we come to the end of that line to realize no hope can be found in any of those things. It's only found in Jesus. And his great promise there in Isaiah 59, this great language that, that God's great arm, the arm of the Lord, would come to us. And this is language of Jesus. So that leads us to today, and Aaron read um, our text for today. It's out of Luke chapter 2. Today we want to talk about the great announcement of this great hope that we've been anticipating and God's great promise. So, uh, I'll talk about some specific um, details of this event that uh, Aaron read more on Christmas Eve service. But for today, I want to kind of focus in on one short verse, verse 14. That's all we're going to cover today. The angels' song that they sang. Aaron read it for us that one angel kind of comes and makes this, this announcement, and then the host of angels join in, and, like, I've seen a lot of different kind of depictions of this. My favorite one is like, like where the angel is so excited to share the news, but then all the other angels just can't help but like chime in. And it's like he was about to say this. This was like his solo, but the whole choir was like, no, we have to say it, right? And it's like, oh, that was my moment, right? Just kind of fun to picture. Maybe it's just me. Tough crowd. All right, let's read it. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 says this. Glor this is the choir of angels, the host of angels. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those, 
those with whom he is pleased. Now, it's funny to me how, as we talk about this verse, as we are walking around stores in the hustle and bustle during this time, as we're in the cars rushing all around and and all kinds of things, where these lyrics are being echoed, the crazy juxtaposition of their excitement to declare this truth in song and our, like, contentment with having it be background noise. Because this song is so powerful. Like, the truth of this song, the power of this song is so powerful, and I wonder if it's easy for us to say, hey, the world doesn't understand the power of glory to God in the highest. It's easy for us to see that, but I just wonder for us, like, do we really see the magnitude of these words? They're so familiar to us that it makes sense for us to kind of become numb to them. And so I want us to really focus in on them here today. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at this. Yes, this is a hymn of celebration of the baby's birth, the Messiah that was promised. But these words are also a very clear way of defining our need, our great need. These words point out our great need and God's plan. Um, They define for us so clearly in these words, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So two big parts we're going to look at. First, glory to God in the highest. Um, When we think about glory, you and I are so focused on glory. We are glory attentive. We are glory seeking. We are, in fact, glory obsessed. Everything we do in life is affected by a pursuit of a kind of glory. What do I mean? Well, God created us with the innate desire, drive, primary motivation of our lives that it would be the glory of God, that we would praise him, that we would love him, that we would be devoted to him, that our hearts would be inclined to him. This is how God created us, with this inward focus of our life being on God. And all of creation was was then designed to remind us of the glory of God. Like all of creation is meant to be these fingers like pointing at the glory of God. You see a mountain, you're like, wow, look at that mountain. God's amazing. Like look at the snow, look at the birds, the, the vibrant colors all around us, fall leaves, scary storms, the touch of another human, the tone of a loved one's voice, the sun rising, the dark of night, worms and hot cups of tea, all these things and many, many more are meant to be this pointing back, like isn't God incredible? They're all meant to point us there, but sadly, in an act of disobedience and rebellion, Adam and Eve choose to live for the glory of creation rather than the glory of God. They're content with finding awe and pleasure and glory in creation and not moving that gaze upwards to creator. So as a result, there is glory confusion in our lives. There is, in fact, a glory war raging in our hearts. That we don't always live for the glory of God. There are other glories that can compete in our hearts for this one glory. Like while we're stuck in traffic, I doubt any of us are reminded of God's glory (laughs) We're reminded of our glory and how it's being diminished by everyone else in our way. And we glory in our rage in the moment. We think about so many areas of our life. We think about lust, right? Lust is this exchange 
of the glory of God for momentary sexual pleasure. We think of things like materialism, where it's replacing the glory of God with possessions of physical things. Pride, choosing to live more for self-glory than the glory of God. So maybe a better way or another way to think of it is that we are, in fact, glory thieves. There are times when other glories become more glorious and precious to us, and we convince ourselves that we can live without the glory of God because I'm content with all of these lesser shadow glories. And so we rob God of the glory due him when in fact he is the only one deserving of this glory. And when we fall into this trap, this, the reality is that it never leads us to peace. Peace. It never leads us to satisfaction because the shadow glories cannot fill our hearts. They were never designed to do that. These things were all meant to point us to God, and yet we've made them a God to glory in. We have a glory problem. We are glory confused. So the angels declare glory to God in the highest. Can you imagine what the world would be like if every person lived that way? Glory to God in the highest. Imagine what it would be like to live in a world where every heart, every human being was ruled by the glory of God. We long for this reality. This is the way God designed all human beings to be. All human beings were called, were chosen, were created to live for the glory of God. That's humanness. That was the creation plan, and then in a moment of self-glory and rebellion, that was shattered. And all of us, again, live now in the middle of a glory war and glory confusion. And in this Advent season, we pause to purposely get ourselves ready for the coming of Jesus. And so we declare and we sing glory to God in the highest. God, may it be true in my life and in my soul and in my family and in this church and in this community. God, may your glory be the highest. Second part of Luke 2, verse 14, he speaks of peace. It says, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When we think of peace, we, we simply kind of think of a lack of fighting. But the Old Testament word here that is being brought into the New Testament here is this idea of shalom. Maybe you've heard somebody say that word before. Shalom is this rich word for peace that the Israelites and the Hebrews would speak of. And the idea of peace here is it encompasses so many different facets of life. I'll focus in on just three of them. One, that there's peace with God. That you and I were created for peace with God, right? That we were created so that that the most important thing in our life would be this relationship with God and we would come to him in freedom and be known and there wouldn't be shame, there would be connection and unity between him and that the most meaningful life or the most meaningful relationship that we would have in our life and in our existence would be with God. There would be this peace and unity, this shalom with God. In addition to that, there is peace then within. That a peace with God would allow us to have peace within our own hearts and our minds and our souls. Not peace because we're strong, not peace because we're wise, not peace because we know what's happening next, but rather peace because we have this relationship with the one who rules it all and who guides us by his hand. And so because of our relationship with God, even though we don't know all that there is to be known, and we cannot predict the future and what's happening in the next day, we have peace in our hearts and rest in our soul because we have peace, shalom with God. 
And so when shalom with God is shattered, the result is that our hearts are no longer at rest. There's no peace within us. See, this, this plays out in the garden. We see it right there, right? There is peace between Adam and Eve and God. Sin comes in, destroys that, shatters that peace. And the instant that happens, now there is a rage within their own hearts. They no longer run to God when he, they hear him coming in the garden. Those of you with kids, remember, even when they were young, when, you, when your kids would hear you coming and they would come running to you, arms open, smiling faces, ah, dad's home, mom's home, and they come running to you. This was Adam and Eve, and now there's sin. Shalom has been shattered, and now they're hiding. They're running. I love how rich this word is. When there is shalom, there is... There is no sleepless nights. There is no worry. The the sleepless nights full of fear. When there is shalom, there are no stomach aches of anxiety. When there is shalom, there is no hiding because of guilt and shame. Everything is in order. Peace in my relationship with God. There is peace in the relationship I have with myself. There's peace which then overflows into the third aspect, peace with others. See, when we don't have peace with God, we don't have peace within ourselves, it makes it very hard to live at peace with others. And our lives are marked then by conflict. I don't think that anybody listening to me today has lived a conflict-free 2020. Right? Probably most of us, none of us, have lived a conf- conflict-free November. Probably not even in the last week, free of any moments of irritation or impatience or anger or conflict. Probably not even yesterday, maybe not even yet today. Right? It's amazing that all around us there is unrest. All around us is conflict. We have a peace problem Brokenness with God leads to brokenness within, leads to brokenness in the community all around us. And this song that the angels sing here really does capture the great human dilemma. We are glory thieves, shalom shattered. And it defines for us our great need. This is not a reality. We need it to be a reality. And this is the hymn pointing than to the great mission of the Messiah. What is this mission? Listen, you know this. Jesus did not come first on a political mission to establish an earthly kingdom. He did not come on an educational mission just to correct our worldview. Jesus didn't come on a psychological mission just to make sure we felt okay. Jesus, in fact, didn't even come on a religious mission to make sure that you did all the external religious things that you were supposed to do to be appropriate. Jesus' mission is much more radical than that and much more fundamental than that. And if you don't understand that, you misunderstand his mission completely. If I have a glory problem, If I have a peace problem, then what I ultimately have, what you ultimately have, what we all ultimately have, is a heart problem. And we keep going back to this week after week because it's that important. We have fundamentally a heart problem. David nails it when he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. That's what we need. What we need is radical, personal, long-term heart change because that's our real problem. The prophecy of the coming Christ are very clear that he is coming to address our great problem. Ezekiel eleven nineteen echoes this. He says, I will give them a new heart. I will take 
that heart of stone out of them, and I will replace it with a heart of flesh. That's how it works. You have a stony heart where there is no peace. You are glory thieves. You need a new heart, which now will be focused on me, where there will be peace with me, which will result in peace in you and peace with others. But we have to get to the heart of the problem. Decorations on your tree will not fix it. Lights in the front yard will not fix it. Buying expensive gifts, receiving wonderful gifts, none of it is going to fix it. The only thing that will fix this, the mission of Jesus Christ, is I came to change your heart. That's why we celebrate. This is the Advent point, to remember his real purpose, his mission. And I'm going to stress the word, his mission. When we read in Ezekiel there just a second ago, right, I will give them a new heart. I will take the, that heart of stone out of them, and I will replace it with the heart of flesh. Where is all of the work being done? Is it by us, or is it by Jesus? It is Jesus. The Lord says, I will. I will do this. Not you. You can't change your heart. No, but I can be a really good person. Good luck with that next 10 minutes you think you can pull this off. Because then pride is going to set in that, look, man, I'm doing really well. Now you've ruined it, right? Like, <laughs> we, we go on and on talking about this, but it's such a reality. We get stuck thinking that Jesus had this mission. Thanks, I'll take it from here. I'll, I'll be a better person. I'll start going to church. I'll give more. I'll stop swearing. I promise this time. Like, whatever it is, like, I can make me a better person. I can change my heart. False. And as soon as you do that, you revert back to glory thief. See, it's his mission. He comes. He does the work. He gets the glory. And again, now all of creation, including us, points to and marvels in glory to God in the highest. And this reality of having our eyes open to see that this is the desperate place of the world should, should break our hearts. Like our hearts should be broken by the fact that, that this is not a reality in the world. It is a tragedy that masses and masses of human beings are not living at peace with God. Like, it's not okay that people who, who walk the streets of this world walk apart from God and are not living at peace with God. It's not okay that masses of people in the United States, in our own country, are not living at peace with God. It's not okay that people in our own community are not living at peace with God. It's not okay that people in our own families are not living at peace with God. It's not okay that people within this very church are not living at peace with God because that's how we were all made to live. At peace with God our creator. And unfortunately what happens is we numb ourselves to that reality. And when we do that, we convince ourselves in some way that it's not a big deal, and if it's not a big deal, then Jesus really didn't need to come. But the reason the angels declared glory to God in the highest is because we needed that to be a reality in our lives. And the situation was so desperate, the mission so great, that God himself would have to step into creation to take on flesh to rescue us from ourselves. It is a desperate, desperate situation. If it were okay for us to live in broken relationship with God, then Jesus would never have needed to come. But it is desperate. So desperate that the Bible uses the word Savior to describe our Messiah. We needed saved. He didn't need helped. 
We didn't need assisted. We, need, we needed rescued and saved from death. Just didn't need a leg up. Didn't need a pat on the back. You were dead. And you needed a miracle to come back to life. He ends this with, with whom he is pleased. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Maybe a better translation is peace on whom his favor is placed. Maybe a better translation, peace on those with whom his grace is given. See, the only way we have peace with God is through his grace. And the vehicle of God's grace is a death. See, the stolen glory and the shattered peace that we are all guilty of results in a punishment of death. Death being an ultimate separation from God, your creator. And so the only rescue for this is the gospel. And this is what we're going to talk about next week. But you and I, as Christians, we celebrate this, we remember it, we hold it so close to us that we remind ourselves that Jesus came not just to be born as a cute, fat baby in a manger in Bethlehem. He came on a mission knowing before he stepped into humanity, I am going to die. The situation is so grave, the situation so dark, the sin so horrendous, that the only remedy for this situation is I must go and live the life that they cannot, have not lived, and I will die a death that they all deserve. And in me dying that death, I will give them grace. I will take the punishment due them, I will take it on myself, and I will give them the life that I have. And this gift of grace is just that. It is a gift of grace. You cannot earn it. It is not merited. It is a gift to all those who would receive. And so, let me say this. As the worship team begins to make their way back up, we are going to share in a time of communion in just a minute. Um, During our singing, I would invite you to head back to the tables and grab communion. After our singing, we will share in that together. But let me just remind us as we approach this time of worship and communion, What we are remembering is Jesus' mission and what he accomplished. That Jesus came to rescue us. And the bread Jesus met with his disciples and said, "Take, take this bread and let it be this reminder of my body broken to you. God, who is spirit, took on flesh. He became like one of us. And in the cup we remember the great sacrifice that Jesus died for us, willing to die on the cross in our place for our sins. So, during our singing, go back, grab the emblems, go back to your seat, hold those, we'll share those together after our singing. For now, let's pray. And then we'll stand and worship together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the reminder of the angels' song today. That, God, we celebrate their celebration words. And, God, their words are our prayer. Glory to God in the highest. God, may that be true in our lives. May that be true in this world, God, that your glory would be the highest glory of all things. And, God, forgive us for being glory thieves. And, God, bring about your peace. Restore to us through your grace, shalom. Peace with you, peace within our own hearts that results then in peace with each other. God, thank you for this time of reflection. Thank you for this time of study. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship.